Bonjour tout le monde. Euh, il me fait un très grand plaisir d'être avec vous euh, ce matin dans la belle ville de Montréal. Uh, so really a pleasure to be with you this morning uh, and uh, to chair this very distinguished panel uh, to address an important topic uh, on the theme of uh, this year's Conférence de Montréal. Donc, uh, la conférence uh, est sur une, un monde en transition et il y a, je crois, une région qui, qui fait une, une grande partie de cette transition, c'est bien sûr euh, la région de l'Indo-Pacifique. Et je ne crois pas que j'ai besoin de vous dire, de vous raconter la montée de l'Indo-Pacifique. So, I think everyone knows, it's well established, uh, the spectacular economic rise of the Indo-Pacific region uh, over the last few decades. Uh, and also some of the, the, the risks and uh, difficulties uh, of the rise of that region uh, that were, I think, always present but have clearly become much more acute and visible uh, in the last few years and maybe the last decade. So uh, I think we can take as our, our acquis de base that, that the rise of that region as part of the world in transition. Um, but. The, the other part of the theme of the Conférence de Montréal this year is about thriving. About how, so how do you respond? Uh, and if you look at uh, the set of questions uh, that describe this session in particular, um, the, the core question, if you like, was what is a well-developed engagement strategy in the face of the rise of the Indo-Pacific region look like? Um, so that's really going to be uh, our focus this morning uh, around how one responds to the rise of Indo the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, avant de passer à mes panélistes très distingués, je vais juste vous dire, si je peux, quelques mots sur la réponse du gouvernement du Canada. Um, so, just to take a few moments um, and to steal the, 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 the panel chair's privilege to talk to you just very briefly because we have had a very major development in the government of Canada uh, in our response, in our engagement of the Indo-Pacific region. And that was the Indo-Pacific strategy that was announced uh, by uh, Prime Minister Trudeau uh, last fall. Donc, une stratégie de l'Indo-Pacifique qui a été annoncée par le gouvernement du Canada uh, uh, en octobre dernier. Uh, the strategy has five pillars, five aspects to it. So it's uh, around peace and security, uh, trade and prosperity, economic issues, uh, climate change and environment, people-to-people -people ties, and finally, building up our capacity within the government of Canada and with partners to do the engagement that's needed across those other four pillars. Donc, voilà. Juste en très bref, euh, la stratégie euh, Indo-Pacifique du gouvernement du Canada reposant sur ces cinq piliers. Mais si vous retenez deux choses sur la stratégie Indo-Pacifique, je vous laisse avec deux choses qui sont euh, d'abord l'argent et ensuite le fait que ce n'est pas une stratégie régionale malgré le nom. So the two things you really should keep in mind about this strategy, one is it's not just a policy plan, it's an action plan, and it came back with an announcement of approximately $2.3 billion of new resources. So it is, again, more than a piece of foreign policy, it is about action and implementation backed up with resources. Uh, so that's one important element. And the other important element is, despite its title, this is not a regional strategy. This is about a reorientation of Canadian foreign policy writ large. Um, it is about how we respond to a global shift, a global movement of the economic center of gravity towards the east, uh, and also to the rise of geopolitics, which uh, come to a, a, a very acute point in that region. Um, so again, a, a global reorientation, and just as one example of what that means, some of the new resources will not be going in all into posts in the Indo-Pacific region. Some of them will be ensuring that we have greater Canadian government expertise on China and on the Indo-Pacific in missions in places like Washington, London, Paris, 
New York, where one of our panelists, Louise Blais, served uh, uh, so dis in a distinguished career. Um, so, as you can see, it's, it's truly a global response, it's not just a regional response. Donc, voilà, en très bref, notre stratégie, notre réponse. Um, mais là, je vais me tourner vers, vers notre panel très distingué pour leur poser un peu la même, la même question. Quelle est votre stratégie uh, pour uh, l'engagement vers uh, l'Indo-Pacifique? Uh, so we have with us today Jonathan Berkshire Miller from the McDonald Laurier Institute, Louise Blais of the Business Council of Canada and formerly uh, he head of mission at our permanent at permanent office at the UN in New York, uh, Bernard Spitz um, from uh, the Mouvement des Entreprises uh, Français, uh, and finally, uh, George Montes from the Export Development Corporation of Canada. So again, I'm going to be putting this question first to each of them in turn. And sorry, I should say you, you've got uh, bios of each of them uh, in your program, so I, I will not give you the details, but they all very distinguished uh, careers and I think very well placed to speak to this question. Um, so I'm going to ask them each in turn. Um, Jonathan, because I know McDonald Laurier is a, a think tank, so it's maybe less about your strategy for your own organization and more about the strategy and the advice that you give to others about engagement in the Indo-Pacific. So if I can turn to you, please. Thank you, Sarah, and uh, thank you. It's great to be in Montreal and share this uh, panel with all these distinguished experts. Uh, and before I do that, Sarah, I'm just gonna make a few quick points, but I did wanna give a tip of the hat to, to you and your colleagues at, at Global Affairs Canada, and actually throughout the Canadian government for producing this strategy. Uh, I promise that we're gonna talk about the future, not the past. Uh, it did take some time, uh, not, not to rib you, um, uh, but, uh, but we're happy that the strategy has come out. And I think your point, is very instructive and very important that this is, yes, it's an Indo-Pacific strategy. Yes, it's targeting some of the diverse economies uh, and the challenges in this region, but it's also a foreign policy document. Uh, there are reasons that countries outside of the Indo-Pacific should be interested in this, uh, this strategy. The pillars that we articulate are broad Canadian foreign policy pillars and not limited exclusively to countries in the Indo-Pacific. So that's the first point. Second point is uh, as I'm a, a former civil servant in a recovery slash recovering public servant, uh, I think it's my duty and perhaps my obligation to put some, some critical um, analysis to on uh, where we see this strategy going forward. Uh, so let me share a couple quick points on this. Um, first of all, and I think because the title of this panel is looking at seizing the economic growth in the region, I think I wanted to start with a fundamental point um, that uh, the traditional look at economics, trade, and investment, and I think in particular we can point to, to Asia in this sense, um, and national security, for example, on the other side, that bifurcation or that sort of false narrative that we had economics, trade and investment here and we had national security over here and we could sort of isolate them. Frankly, that never really existed. That didn't exist in the 70s and 80s and it definitely does not exist now. Uh, you only need to read the, the most recent communique from the G7 leaders uh, on de-risking, for example, uh, to realize that national security on one side and uh, economy are interlinked. It doesn't mean that we need to securitize trade uh, completely, but I think there is that point I think needs to be uh, put forward. The second key point I think is that, and I think for the Canadian audience is that when we engage in the Indo-Pacific, we have to understand this seems like, again, a basic geography point, but the Indo-Pacific is not the transatlantic. It doesn't have the architecture. Yes, there are some multilateral uh, pieces there, such as ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, um, but it does not have the established forums like OECD and other bodies that we have in Europe. So understanding that makes us be more creative. We have to go back to some of the bilateral relationships and find ways to really listen um, maybe 70 to 80% of the time, and then actually prescribe some action the other 20% uh, rather than the opposite where we come in with a lot of ideas, but we're not actually sure <laughs> the region wants uh, or will receive those ideas well. Um, 
And I think a final point, uh, I won't get into too much of the prescriptive, Sarah, now, but I think we need to think about specific niches where we actually have some value added. Um, and one I will leave you uh, with is on the trade side uh, with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, which we are now the second biggest economy due to uh, uh, some large country close to us, which I will not name, uh, which has withdrawn from the, from the deal. Uh, we are the second biggest economy next to Japan in that, in that uh, deal. Uh, I think it's in our interest not just to see it progress with the current membership, but to look at the, the, the future partners that are joining and, and actively work with Japan and others in that agreement to, to promote the, the growth of that agreement. So I'll stop there, uh, but very much looking forward to the discussion. Thanks. Thanks very much, Jonathan. And very interesting since where I sit in Bangkok, Thailand is still thinking about whether to join the CPTPP as it's, it's now become. Uh, but I think that's a wonderful segue to Louise. So for with uh, some perspective from the Business Council of Canada and maybe also from your, your, your diplomatic, your distinguished diplomatic past as well. Merci beaucoup, Madame l'ambassadrice. Je suis ravi d'être avec vous aujourd'hui. Thank you for the invitation. I couldn't have, uh, have better panelists uh, to discuss this with, so I'm delighted. So I'm, I'm, I'll come from the business community here and, and just the Canadian business community in particular. And of course, we welcome the Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, specifically for the reasons that you've highlighted, uh, that where it really had a lot of humph, it had a lot of uh, money attached to it, a lot of action. They weren't just words out there. Now, from, from the business community, at a time where there's a lot of talk about nearshoring, which also we believe in, I think there are certain strategic um, supply chains that, that would benefit from being reshored and closer to home with our, with our North American partners, we really view the Indo-Pacific as a, an enormous area of potential growth for, for Canada, for obvious reasons. It represents 50% of the GDP of the world. So the case has been made, doesn't need to be made further. And so in a strategy, though, one of the things that we would have liked to have seen, and I think it may come, is the issue, if we're going to really boost our, our exports and our, our, our trade growth with the region, we need to, to marry that with investment in our infrastructure for export, whether it's sports, trade routes. We really have to look at that because there are bottlenecks, there already are. We faced them during the pandemic, and I think they really really there's an investment that needs to be made there. The same point that we heard yesterday and, and to what you were saying, Jonathan, about really spending time to hear what our partners in the region want. And one of the things they want from Canada is cleaner energy. And, uh, and so we really have to think about uh, whether we will help them uh, with the LNG requirements. And I think, you know, the Business Council obviously believes that that's an area that we should, we should uh, focus in. Not only is it the right thing to do economically, obviously for us, but it will help those partners' emissions uh, to go down. So Canada has a chance to have an exponential impact on emission reduction way beyond our own domestic uh, reduction. So those are the places where we feel that perhaps the strategy could keep uh, going uh, for, uh, forward on, but overall very positive. Merci beaucoup, Louise. Et ensuite, euh, je vais passer euh, la parole à, à M. Bernard Switz. Donc, euh, une, une perspective euh, peut-être euh, un peu différente, donc, euh, vue de, de la France. Euh, mais je sais que pour l'Europe, pour la France, euh, l'engagement dans la région est très important, vous aussi. Oui. D'abord, merci beaucoup aux organisateurs et je suis très heureux aussi de participer à ce panel. Um, I think... Uh, I agree with about all that has been said. We, we have to distinguish between um, micro and macro. When we are talking about uh, uh, Indo-Pacific, uh, we can talk in terms of strategy, in terms of diplomacy, but no company thinks like that. They don't have a, a, a really uh, an Indo-Pacific strategy. They have an Indian strategy. They have a Chinese strategy. They have a Korean strategy. They have an Indonesian strategy. Uh, we are preparing the next B20, which will be in India in August. Last year it was in Indo Indonesia, and I went to see all. You know, in France we have a, see, an industrial. Uh, we have se uh, more than uh, seven thousand subsidiaries of French yeah. companies in the in the zone. But we have a lot, some uh, very large companies which are global. Some of them 
have just uh, decided to don't to not uh, to to don't invest in uh, in China, for instance, mm. for a lot of reasons to belong to some others in in India. For, uh, we have a group of companies which will uh, follow the the B20 in India, but uh, it's a selection of, of companies because not many of them have had bad experiences, and so they prefer another partner in the in the in the area. So that is a, a first point in terms of. Uh, uh, Globalization. Uh, I, I agree that there is a big combination between uh, uh, the, the business aspect, the potential, the growth potential, and uh, the, the geostrategic approach. And of course, uh, when you want to invest or to make business in China, you have to decide whether you can share or not your industrial uh, uh, property and uh, your intellectual property. And uh, if you don't, you make the you have to a difficult choice because if you don't want to do that. You, you let the, the, the market to, to competitors. If you do that, you have the risk. And you know, in, for instance, in, in, in Germany, part of the problems, economical problems of Germany are the Mittelstand, uh, which are now competed by the uh, Chinese companies who have taken advantage of the uh, transfer of technology that they, 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 they got uh, uh, some, the, some years ago. And this is something which, which is true in all the, the area. We, seen from France, it's a very narrow uh, angle. Seen from Europe, it's a little bit, uh, uh, I think, uh, more uh, uh, relevant. Et je pense qu'on a été d'une façon, enfin, uh, on a une prise de conscience aujourd'hui qu'en Europe et en France en particulier, on a été d'une extraordinaire naïveté. C'est-à-dire que on a, uh, en fait, uh, cherché à produire à, à, à moindre coût dans la région, et qu'en faisant ça, on a contribuer à la désindustrialisation de nos pays, à une certaine forme de désespérance des classes moyennes et à une montée des populismes, et à une perte de souveraineté dont on s'est rendu compte au moment du Covid. Et tout ça, on est en train de le réaliser. Et on est en train de le réaliser dans un mouvement de plaque tectonique stratégique dans lequel on voit bien qu'il y a aujourd'hui une espèce de guerre froide qui est en train de s'installer, de nouvelles guerres froides qui ne s'installent plus au-dessus de l'Atlantique, mais au-dessus du Pacifique. Et la question pour l'Europe, c'est quelle va être la place de l'Europe dans ce contexte C'est comme ça qu'il faut comprendre les propos du président de la République française quand il est revenu de Chine. La question, c'est est-ce que l'Europe est condamnée à être la variable d'ajustement de la rivalité euh, entre la Chine et les États-Unis Comment trouver notre place Comment faire du commerce parce que c'est nécessaire et que la, la zone est un partenaire extrêmement important Et comment euh, faire en sorte de le faire en, en préservant euh, le tissu industriel, le développement technologique et la souveraineté euh, en Europe Est-ce que c'est ça, ça It requires a, a, a vision at the European level, which is not obvious. And uh, yes, it's a moment of transition. It's a big moment of transition. And uh, the, the question is how we are going to find the, the right solution. We are starting, and the, the COVID has been a good uh, accelerator of that to change our vision, but it's uh, something that is it's not uh, done yet. And, but we are exactly at the moment of the how to, to take our destiny into our, our hands. Thank, thank you. And I'm going to turn to our final panelist now. Uh, so George Money is of the Export Development Corporation of Canada. So again, George, if you want to say a bit, I, I know EDC has been very much part of the discussion within Government of Canada around the Indo-Pacific, but uh, very interested to hear from your perspective as a Crown Corporation um, okay. where, where you're going on the region. So first off, thank you for the opportunity to be here today to speak. From EDC's perspective, you know, following on the comments of my colleagues here, we're extremely bullish in the market. You know, this is where we see Canada's future growth. And we're not just talking about tomorrow, but we have to start now for planning, you know, five to seven years from now. Uh, to the comment made by Ben Allen, you're right, many, many companies are looking at it a country by country strategy. And what's important, I think, in the region is that it is a coordinated approach. Uh, a lot of times when you, you mention the, the area, it's like it's one thing, but different governments, different policies, uh, different nuances that, that have to be accounted for. And in order to be successful in market, the, the first thing for us is you have to be there. 
Uh, I heard this numerous times in market is you, you can't do this from abroad. You can't pop in and pop out. You have to be there. You have to stay there. Uh, as a result of that, what we're doing as EDC is expanding our footprint in market. So we're opening a couple of representations this year in Jakarta and Seoul, looking to upwards of six over the coming year here, really so that we can have a presence on the ground so that we can provide the support required by Canadian business. Uh, for us, it's, it's difficult for someone to take that plunge to go into market. So we're focusing really primarily on those accounts, those customers in market who could require our support to do more, using our tools and products such as insurance, financing, and so on, whether it's someone needs the benefit of financing to scale or insurance to protect their, their deliverables. Uh, our goal is to be there to support, and you can't do that from abroad. And part of this infrastructure for us is also understanding that the need for infrastructure in market, because you are in a completely different time zone, you, it is a completely different shift culturally, but you have to have presence and you have to partner in market as well in order to be successful. So for us, really, the keys are you have to be there, you have to be on the ground, you need to partner in market, and then we're looking for ways to, to de-risk for Canadian companies entering to market through the tools that we have so that when they do take the plunge, we can ensure their success. Thanks, George. And I know, in fact, that, that uh, I'm acutely aware of your desire to be in market since one of the places you're looking at putting some people in market is with us in Bangkok. We're so. moving in. <laughs> <laughs> so so we, 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 we welcome you as a new part of the team. So I think a, a very rich first discussion and, and a really good sense of, of, of both the, the opportunities, the interest, and, and George, as you said, being very bullish on the market, but, but also the, the both the, the bigger picture challenges, so the sort of geostrategic issues that Bernard mentioned, um, but but also some slightly more specific challenges around infrastructure, around IP and so on, uh, IP protection. So 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 a range of different things to to uh, to deal with. Uh, if I can, the one thing that struck me out of several of the comments, and I want to put back to the panelists, um, is the the variability of the region, how different it is, so that it's actually rather hard, as you said, to Bernard, I think you said, c'est difficile d'avoir une stratégie Indo-Pacifique parce qu'en fait, c'est l'Inde, c'est la Chine, c'est l'Indonésie, euh, c'est la Thaïlande pour nous, donc euh, des, des pays très, très différents, donc on ne peut pas le traiter en fait, je crois que c'est, bon, l'Europe, bien sûr, c'est variable, mais but still, it, the, I think the degree of variability in the region is, is high and that that is, is a difficulty. So maybe if I can go back and perhaps starting with Louise, just on uh, to what extent you see your, your membership and, and the business community, are, are, what are they doing? Are they thinking just, oh, I want to be in India, I want to be in China, or are they thinking about the region more broadly and, and how, how you do that? That's a very fair point, and I have to say that from from the business community, it's true that there are there are definitely centers that are more attractive than others within the region. I think one of those that uh, that I think is key is, of course, India. Uh, India will be uh, will is outpacing China and by many factors and will over time. I mean, this is a, and it happens to be a democracy, so it's attractive from that point of view. Now, it's a complex market. It is fragmented, uh, fragmented from within. Though you could argue Canada is too, but uh, never mind. But you know there are challenges in coming into India. Uh, but it's 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 one where we're really glad to see the government having focus now with a specific. Uh, progressive trade agreement with, with the country that we hope will be, will be finalized by the end of the year. I think that this is a place where EDC, Global Affairs Canada, can really help accompany companies for, because of those challenges. But, you know, this is one point... Uh, 8 billion uh, soon. The, the consumer uh, spending explosion in uh, India is absolutely uh, phenomenal. And so there, there really is a prize at the end of that hard work of building those contacts. So if, you know, I'm teasing China, India out, I'm not saying it's the only country, obviously, but it is one that I think is, is key. And maybe I'll just, I'll, I'll just uh, conclude my response by saying that I think it's important though, as we engage individually with countries, that we understand their positioning within the regions. Yeah. There are rivalries, there are opportunities within regions. And so when we do 
quote unquote bet on a country and we when uh, uh, many companies go in I think it's important to develop joint ventures mm -hmm. to go further afield in the region and really rely on regional partners to help us enter some of those smaller more difficult markets to go in so we got to go you know build that trust build that uh, that, uh, that those partnerships and I think um, and be smart about the politics that that you know that that can reign in a region as well and as I'm adding something so I'm <laughs> sorry but in this, you know, the United States, our, our, our perennial partner, is definitely a partner in some cases and maybe not in others. So we have to really understand where we work with the Americans and our friends, the Mexicans, again, and where we just go alone. So those are, these are really thoughtful uh, evaluations that have to happen when you go into a region like the Indo-Pacific. Yeah. Merci, Louise. And a very good point, I think, about being responsive and aware about what the partners in the region need and want from us and, and from others. Um, and maybe on that, I can go back just a little bit to Jonathan, because you raised that as well, about being creative, but also about listening mm -hmm. to the region. So if what's your sense of, uh, I mean, it's a tough question, but, mm -hmm. but, but that's why you're on the panel. Um, <laughs> what's your sense of what the region wants from Canada? Um, what, 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 what do you think we can, we can offer and Canadian companies, Canadian partners can offer uh, that the region needs or wants? Well, it's a great question. We have an hour, right? <laughs> uh, 25 minutes. <laughs> so um, obviously each country in this region is, is unique and has their own agency and their own wants and needs and desires of Canada. And one thing I should caveat that with is it's great to have empathy. It's great to listen. But it's not, of course, in the Canadian interest just to do something that Thailand wants to do or that Japan wants to do. But we do have to have that balance of what are Canadian interests, what are Canadian values, and how does that link up to what the region wants. Um, so in general, broad brush terms, I think they want balance. Um, I think we talked about some of the geostrategic risks in the region. They do want Canadian investment, they do want trade, they do want infrastructure, but they also want empathy on some of the security issues in the region. So um, one of the points I'll often make is that if you go to Manila, Seoul, Hanoi um, today versus 10, 15 years ago, the discussion is very different. They're very uh, uh, attentive to some of the security issues. So we have to at least, doesn't mean we have to replace the United States or France or others who have a much bigger security footprint, but we absolutely do have to listen and find niche ways to engage. But I wanted to just quickly go back, Sarah, to your point on uh, the region and Bernard's really interesting anecdote about the different countries. And from a business perspective, you have a strategy for Japan and India. And I think that makes a lot of sense. The region is diverse. You know, it goes from, from Delhi to Tokyo, from Port Moresby to Dhaka. I mean, there's so many different uh, areas. And from a business perspective, it's very different how you engage. Uh, but why is it important that we are talking Indo-Pacific? And I think Frankly, it goes back to the geography textbooks. You look at this region and what makes it unique. And again, it's very much the maritime connectivity. So this hits on, this sort of hedges on both sides on the security and economic side. There's the security implications, which we're all aware of, whether it's South China Sea, Taiwan, East China Sea, but it's also economic. It's uh, most of the trade in this region continues to be maritime. Uh, and it's not that it's bilateral trade, one country to one country, but the supply chains are interconnected. So I think it's very important for us to think of this region and Canada is starting to make, um, not just with a strategy, but the Chambers of Commerce, for example, uh, linking up in an Indo-Pacific Chambers of Commerce. We're starting to understand that these supply chain connect connects are very, very important. And the last point I wanted to mention, following up on Louise's point in her first intervention on energy, you know, full-throated agreement uh, with you on that. Um, and I think that we need to be preparing not only for the challenge of today, which our European friends are going through, obviously with Russia's uh, a brutal prosecution of a war in Ukraine, but also but the potential challenges of tomorrow. Um, Japan and South Korea, two quick data points, 90% uh, of their energy uh, traverses from the Gulf, uh, from the Middle East, through the Strait of Hormuz, through the Strait of Malacca, through the South China Sea. We hope that it remains peaceful, but we can't bet on that. Uh, and should they be reliant on natural gas from Qatar, the Saudis and the Emiratis, or should there be a, a much more robust uh, presence of Canadian energy? So I leave that up for everyone to make their own decision, but I know that the Japanese and South Koreans very much wish that they, uh, they had more of a Canadian energy footprint. 
I, I, I want to come back to that one because it touches on, on, I think, two very important issues that were raised earlier and maybe Louise raised, but both climate change and energy transition as part of that and, and infrastructure. But before we get to that, I'm, I'm really interested. I want to go back to, to, to Bernard and, and also maybe George's perspective. Bernard, vous avez parlé d'une nouvelle guerre froide. Et, et c'est vrai qu'il y a une division dans la région et, et beaucoup de pays qui se sentent euh, un peu pris au milieu. Euh, entre dans la région et, et peut-être aussi pour le Canada et l'Europe uh, dans une rivalité entre la Chine uh, et les États-Unis. But how do we match that up? That sort of the, uh, maybe the beginnings of a, of a new Cold War, according to some. But at the same time, as Jonathan just said, it's it's the region of supply chains. It's the region of integrated production. I mean that that's where all of that really uh, came to fruition. So. Interested from both your perspectives, how do you sort of, how do you match those, how do you manage those two things, that, that we have that increasing sense of rivalry and tension, and yet it's an extremely integrated region that, that thrives on producing things all over the place and shipping them in containers to one another? Hmm. <coughs> well, uh, we, we all say that uh, there is a huge uh, connection between uh, economic commercial uh, approach and uh, the, the strategic approach I mean you, you may when you you may business in a country you have to integrate the factor of risk and the geopolitical risk is today one of the biggest so you cannot uh, be naive and forget that just uh, uh, and so when uh, when you are when a government has or an institution has to make a position they can have a global uh, vision but uh, for for a business they have to they need to know the global vision but they, they have then to make some choices and i think that uh, when we are talking about a, a country like china of course it has a lot of consequences and i understand very well that i was saying that uh, from the european point of view we didn't want to become a stage of uh, the, the, the the rivalry between the us and but it's much more true for 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 canadians of course so it's a, it's a, something that uh, we have to to share how to do that the, the 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 chinese and india for instance they are rival they are there is a clearly a, a game uh, today uh, of balance a lot of people are looking to india to develop their business first because they speak english it's easier but in, in terms of growth it is a, a, a huge uh, uh, target but the vision uh, of India and China is very different. China is much more uh, involved in the management of the planet. Think about the fact that there is a, a plan, a Chinese plan uh, to, for, for Ukraine. Mm. It's the first time ever, I mean, since uh, centuries, that you have a, a plan coming from uh, China to explain to the Western world or Europe uh, well, how they should make peace. It has never happened, so it's a way. And uh, they have. Uh, we we all know about the Silk Road. Mm -hmm. We just do not do not want to to be the Silk Highway because uh, in Europe there are a lot of uh, um, uh, weaknesses, and uh, they have bridge. They have both harbors, infrastructures, and so on. So they want to control uh, all this logistic uh, and uh, supply chain. Uh, all over, all over the, the the Western world. So this is something you have to to take in consideration. Uh, uh, but uh, this being said, the companies make business, so they have to make their own choices. And there are a lot of very different markets which could could be uh, full of opportunities. We know how much the Chinese market, for instance, is important for a lot of uh, sectors like luxury and so on. But uh, my final point is about energy. I want to come back to this because Please. there is something that we cannot, we are all involved in, it's the climate issue. Mm. I mean, we cannot solve the climate issue in the, within the Western world uh, and forgetting uh, I, uh, the, uh, the, 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 this area, which uh, is the most, qui est la plus grosse consommatrice de carbone. Et bon, et donc, à part les Allemands qui ont redécouvert la lignite, mais ça, c'est un autre sujet. Non, bien sûr. Et, et je, vais, je veux vraiment revenir sur les questions de climat, énergie, mais juste uh, before that, just a quick question to George, which is, how, how does EDC deal with political risk in the region? Because, uh, as Bernard was just saying, it is a region with significant political risk. So, and it's a tough one, but we do, you know, we see it as an opportunity. This is... A lot is going to tie into a business's risk appetite in terms of their ability and willingness to enter into a region, and that's where we're here to help with the de-risking. 
But what we're seeing is what this has led to is supply chain recalibration. It's forced new partnerships and relationships throughout the region, uh, political, economical, security-wise, that have, that's really just us adapting as Canada in the market so that we can continue to support uh, Canada abroad. Um, I, I do want to actually come back to, to India there very quickly as well, because as you look at it in terms of markets and, and the mention of the, the competition, great opportunity in India. Um, having spent a bit of time there, not necessarily easy to do business, but part of what we're trying to do and what we need to do is it, it comes back to partnership. So the idea of joint ventures, the idea of, of trying to engage with some of the major players in market who can provide us with the knowledge, expertise, networks, so that we can help uh, those Canadian countries you know, go in eyes open with connectivity in market, because again, difficult to do from abroad, especially into a, a new region. And I know you'll come back to energy security, but, but that is also one of the huge areas uh, for opportunity as well. You know, ESG is paramount for us at, at EDC. This ties in across the Indo-Pacific, especially in India, as we help countries to transition. And ESG isn't a nice to have anymore. Uh, it, it is a necessity due to the scarcity of resources. So really, this represents a huge opportunity uh, for Canada in terms of the capabilities that we're able to bring to market to help support that transition. Thanks. And I, I think Louise has a hot pursuit, but I, I'm going to ask her not just to do the hot pursuit, but also maybe to, to, to lead off on the question of, of, of climate change energy transition. So maybe to see a bit more about how you see a role for, for Canada or in the relation between Canada and the Indo-Pacific region in moving forward. What, as you said, uh, George, is, is, I mean, is an existential issue that, that we need to address on a global scale. Sure, happy to. So just quickly, uh, just to follow up on, on George's point, and, and this is where, you know, we all have to work together yeah. to do this. And uh, the Business Council of Canada, for example, just when the, uh, the Minister of Commerce and Trade was here from India a few weeks ago, we launched a partnership between the Business Council of Canada and the Federation of Indian uh, Business Chambers. You know, just to do exactly what to your point, making sure that business people are, are really um, having that exposure to each other, that contact that will lead to the kinds of, of, of joint ventures or accommodation into market that, that we want. So those, I think this is what the business community can do, uh, not just individually as, as businesses, but collectively through association. I think, I think that's a key point to make. And then just briefly on, on the issue of climate change, I mean, I, we, Canada has an opportunity to really make a difference, not just by our redu reducing our own emissions, because let's face it, that's just a rounding error at this point. Yes, our per capita is terrible, and yes, we should continue to, uh, to, uh, to uh, decarbonize our, our economy, but at the same time, no matter how successful we are in doing that, if we're not able to help other countries also meet their own targets, we're not going to get there. And we're lucky because we have these resources at our disposal. We have ingenuity, we've got the talent, we have the know-how. And it really is, we don't talk about this often enough um, from, in, our, you know, in my personal point of view about what is it that Canada can do to help other countries. Because if we don't, uh, if, if the trajectory continues in the way that it is in the Indo-Pacific, because with growth comes often greater emission and we know um, in China, the case is not uh, uh, great at the moment, and they negotiated, you know, extensions, which is, but if we can help them get there to, to transition from coal to other greener sources, really, we have a moral responsibility to look at that. And that's, that's not necessarily an easy thing to sell the Canadian public, to that maybe for certain aspects, we might need to raise our own emission to help others reduce their own, but they, there's not enough of that holistic conversation. Uh, you go to COP and you discuss, you know, how everyone's gonna meet their own targets, but it really is not a national problem. It's a global problem. And we should really be talking much more about how we're going to do this together and what is Canada's role in that. And then work with um, uh, familiarizing that more with the Canadian public, I think would be, uh, would be a, a good step forward and would be really helpful, particularly in that region. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. And, and I would say, not in climate change per se, but in a closely allied 
area biodiversity, we, we have a little bit of a, a bright light because here in Montreal, we managed to co-host with China uh, the latest conference of the parties uh, on, on, the bio, on biodiversity um, because it was due to be held in China and couldn't because of COVID restrictions and came out with the Kunming Montreal Declaration. So that, and that was, I think, a bit of a risk for our government about whether that was going to be possible. So uh, an area, a bright, bright spot. Um, let me turn then to, to Jonathan, and I think Bernard wants to jump in too as well on, on, on this, this issue, which is, is both, both geopolitics and, and economics. Well, thank you. And uh, just to follow up a little bit on Louise's great comments, which I would agree with, um, climate change obviously is a global risk for all of us um, and an existential risk for all of us. I think for the Indo-Pacific, it's an acute existential yeah. risk. So I'm going to give you a couple examples here. A small country in the Pacific Tuvalu it may cease to exist largely in about 50 years um, because of the, the sea uh, levels rising. Literal states in the region, such as Bangladesh, um, parts of, of Thailand, et cetera, uh, all of them that rely on their ports for, for trade, their, uh, their largest uh, metropolitan areas are close to, close to ports, uh, also are at deep risk. Um, that being said, what a lot of these countries are suffering from is not just the negative effects of climate change, flooding, et cetera, uh, but also uh, a risk of other geostrategic factors. So we talked a little bit of the South China Sea, for example. Uh, some of the things that are happening there are not just territorial, they're not just security, but the livestock, the biodiversity that most of those literal states rely on for their food, for their economy, uh, is being stripped away by great power politics. So I think many in the region are facing a double whammy in a sense, uh, where they have the challenges of climate change and then great power politics uh, lumped on top of that. Where does Canada fit into all of this? I think <laughs> we have to look at this in two sort of realms. Number one, I think we can work on capacity building and working with, with partners in the region on climate change. But I think it's not an either or. It's not the idea that we, at the same point, don't leverage our energy resources. I think that we realize that there has to be a transition in process. Uh, we're working with many states in the region on renewables. I think Japan and South Korea are two of the more mature democracies. Um, but I think rather than necessarily coming in with a sort of a lecturing or hectoring approach, I think we need to realize that there's a bit of a yin and yang here and that we have to be doing both at the same time, at least in the short term with a move towards uh, medium and long-term, uh, a much more robust approach for the region. So I think I would leave it there. Actually, just one last point is that we need to be looking at pivot states in the region that we can work with that have greater equity and capital uh, than us. Um, and two I would point to is Japan and South Korea, which we have uh, you know, mature relationships with. And when I say pivot states, how can we induce uh, Japan and South Korea as an example, and maybe our Australian friends or our Kiwi friends too, to do things potentially trilaterally, quadrilaterally with us on issues such as climate, energy, infrastructure, et cetera. I think we should be thinking about those opportunities because it's hard for us to forge some of those relationships uh, nascently ourselves. But if we can work with our, with our like-minded friends, I think it would be value added. Absolutely. Bernard, est-ce que vous voulez ajouter quelque chose sur l'énergie et changement oui. climatique? Oui, bien sûr. C'est comme l'éléphant le, le, uh, on the table. Uh, C'est une uh, illustration absolue du fait qu'on est en train de... La, 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 la transition c devrait être aussi une transition vers une nouvelle forme de globalisation mm. plus équilibrée. Uh, c'est plus la globalisation d'il y a 30 ans, uh, la, la Terre est plate et uh, Fukuyama. Non, c'est une globalisation d'une d'une autre uh, d'une autre nature. Le président de Total uh, disait, uh, M. Pouyanné disait il n'y a pas longtemps, il disait mais il y a une, une forme d'absurdité, on, on va dépenser des fortunes pour réduire d'un demi-degré uh, la, la température en, en Europe, alors que uh, cet argent serait beaucoup mieux utilisé si on le donnait aux pays en développement qui eux uh, font uh, le, le le, le plus de, 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 de réchauffement de, de la planète. Donc, euh, quelque chose qui ne marche pas. On a essayé en, Fran en Europe d'inventer la taxe carbone aux frontières. Ça part d'un bon principe. On va taxer les produits qui euh, sont peu vertueux du point de vue du carbone. Mmh. Bon, on a évidemment démontré immédiatement que ce qui allait se passer, c'est que les produits exportés seraient euh, vertueux de carbone, mais que tout les, les, le reste en, inter en, en interne serait, lui, euh, produit avec, euh, dans des conditions désastreuses. Donc ça ne sert à rien. Et il ne faut pas oublier que le commerce de la réseau Indo-Pacifique est fait à 60% en interne à l'intérieur de la zone. Donc, euh, on n'a aucune solution réaliste, sauf 
sauf à inventer, effectivement, dans cet accord, dans cette euh, dimension d'intérêt euh, commun, de trouver une nouvelle forme de globalisation qui intègre cette dimension-là et qui le fasse de façon équilibrée. C'est le point sur lequel il peut, il doit y avoir une forme de, je ne dirais pas de consensus, mais en tout cas de, 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 de trouver de nouveaux équilibres euh, qui, ne reflètent, qui sont des équilibres différents des équilibres financiers, différents des équilibres politiques, différents des équilibres idéologiques et militaires, mais euh, il y a une seule planète. Effectivement, je crois qu'on a de plus en plus le sens que c'est dans la région, en fait, les, où tous les enjeux globaux, vraiment, sont, sont là de façon très aiguë, donc que, qu'il y a un découpement entre eux, euh, nos stratégies envers l'Indo-Pacifique et nos stratégies à l'échelle globale. Um, we are, I'm conscious, almost out of time, um, but I wanted to ask all the panelists if you had any, any last thoughts or any, anything you really wanted to tell the audience that you hadn't had a chance to. So just one last uh, lightning round uh, on, on any uh, further thoughts or advice Um, for our audience here and, and for others uh, on engagement uh, in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, so, Jonathan. I can go very quickly first. Um, yeah, the, the signs, the momentum is going in the right direction. So, Sarah, as you mentioned at the beginning, we have an Indo-Pacific strategy now. It didn't get mentioned yet uh, today, but we now have a special envoy uh, for the Indo-Pacific who is based in Tokyo, uh, concurrently the ambassador to Japan. All of this is positive, but I think I wanted to hinge on this special envoy as a, not him personally, but on the, on the role itself, just as a, as something moving forward and nothing on the, the nomenclature of the, of the name special, but I think we have to keep it in our heads that this is no task force. This is no special project, but this is a long-term investment. This is, uh, our engagement in this region, um, cannot be something that we think about in a 10 year, 50 year hundred year gap, but the future of humanity in many ways, what we talked about, whether it's climate risks, economic opportunities, geostrategic great power politics will be defined by what happens in the Indo-Pacific. So I think that's a first a sort of fundamental point for us going forward. And the last point is that we have a diversity of views here on the panel uh, from <laughs> private sector, government, uh, former government, um, is that in order to be successful, uh, all is not on the shoulders of Sarah, you and your colleagues, uh, although Thankfully. a lot is on your shoulders. Thankfully. Um, but this is a whole of government, uh, a whole of Canada approach. When you think of the provinces, the cities, yep. uh, research institutes, think tanks, private sector, uh, EDC, et cetera. So I think in order to be successful, we're going to have to have all guns blazing. Ideally, even though we have different views, uh, somewhat going, putting the ship in the right direction. Um, so that's, that would be uh, how I would end off. Thanks. Again, we're very short on time, but just very brief thoughts uh, from our other panelists. I'll, I'll go in very briefly. Mm -hmm. Désolé, Bernard, de parler encore du Canada et un peu moins de l'Europe. Mais, mm -hmm. mais juste pour terminer, I think it's fun. It's really, we really believe from the business community and we're encouraging our government to join the uh, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, which was launched by President Biden. I think it was an oversight that Canada wasn't included. I think, I don't know why we're still not including, but we should include it. We should continue to knock on that door. While we might not want to partner always with our American friends. Uh, certainly in this case, we, we can't afford not to be part of the IPEF. And so that, that I wanted to make that point because I hadn't come up yet. Well, well, maybe one last uh, food for thoughts that we had not the time to, 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 to investigate, but just uh, it's about currency and the finance. Um, another way to, to be Uh, very strong and uh, to influence the, the, the world is uh, how is uh, the, the, what is uh, the way of the currency. You, there is a, another fight, uh, the Huan is trying to, in a way, to, 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 to challenge the dollar. And uh, it's something that we see already in the, in the purchase of energy and so on. And this is another element that we have to keep in mind if we have a, to have a global vision of, of uh, what's going to happen. Okay. We'll, we'll have to have another panel on that one. George, last thoughts. Uh, for me, it'd be, it'd be three things. So one, as I mentioned before, you need to be there. You need to be present in market. That will make the, the difference and, and we'll be there to support you. 
the second piece, ESG, I see this as Canada's strategic advantage. There's so much value we can bring in that market with the Canadian expertise that exists today to help them with their transition, to help the, keeping in mind that many of the countries in the market are at different stages of the evolution, I'll call it, and we can be there along the way to provide some, some guidance. And then to the other comment that was made, important that it is a Team Canada approach. So across the various crowns and so on, because I hear it time and time again, you know, I met the representative from France, but then I also met EDC, CCC, the province of Quebec, uh, the province of BC. And what's good is we all work together, so there's no wrong door, but we need to make sure it's a coordinated uh, approach to have greater success. Thanks. And I would just echo some of the things that have been said here. Much of my career has been spent in the region. And my advice to everybody is be there, go there. And absolutely, that we need not only a whole of Canada approach, but I think, again, hearing some of the things Bernard said, uh, an approach that also works with, with partners in Europe, some of the partners that Jonathan mentioned. Uh, so to be very joined up, very connected, and, and in a spirit of partnership. Thank you so much. That was an extremely rich discussion. As I said, I think we could do one or several more panels out of some of the sub-themes. Uh, so I'd ask everyone to please join me in thanking our excellent panel today. Thank you. Thank you.